Okay, folks, today we're going to discuss light emission and absorption in semiconductors and in compound semiconductors. So I know you're all very eager to understand how do you, how do you make lasers work. Tell me more about this rollable organic light emitting diode display, solar cells, uh, CCD and CMOS cameras, uh, fiber optics. Um, we're going to get to those. But the first thing we need to understand is how light interacts with semiconductors. When we get the devices, it will be not too difficult for you because most of these devices we'll see, or the devices used in these systems, are again based on diodes. LEDs, lasers, solar cells, photodetectors, digital cameras, all diode based you'll see. So, today's goal will be to make sure that you are solid on the fundamentals. Okay, I'm going to do this in three sub-lectures. One's going to cover recombination, then we're going to go into photon absorption, then photo photon emission. What we'll see today is all semiconductors can absorb light, but not all can emit light. And efficient absorption or emission always requires careful material and device design. So let's go back to recombination and ge generation, because when we absorb photons in a semiconductor, we know that those can generate carriers. So we need to understand this balance between if I shine light and I generate carriers and I have recombination, what's the total excess carrier concentration I end up having and where do I care? So let's start with the undoped case. So I basically, as review, I've got a semiconductor at 300K and here's the same semiconductor showing the silicon atoms. And at 300K, you've got some electrons which leave the silicon atoms, so they leave the silicon atoms in the valence band. An electron comes up here, creates a hole, right? And then we know that at 300K, they're always moving around, so these are moving around, the holes are moving around. Eventually, they find each other and they recombine. And for every electron, for the undoped case, I have a hole. So if I have four electrons, I've got four holes. Same thing I have over here, four electrons and four holes, okay? And we know that at 300K, you put this thing on the table, and it doesn't just generate carriers forever, right? It doesn't build up to infinite carriers. That generation and recombination cancel each other out. So my generation rate is equal to my recombination rate, which for an undoped semiconductor could be calculated as the recombination coefficient, which has units of cc per second, times the intrinsic carrier concentration. And so this makes sense. If my intrinsic carrier concentration goes up, that's because my generation rate's going up. And that also means I have more carriers, so I'm going to have more recombination as well. So that should all make sense. Again, notice the units here. The units here are 1 over cc per, unit per second of one, for the final generation and recombination. Basically, how many carriers do you generate per unit volume per second? Okay. This recombination factor, we're not going to go into it a ton right now. It can depend on several mechanisms, and so we'll talk more about that later, but there could be multiple mechanisms that determine this, and one mechanism can dominate. So it's not necessarily just them finding each other and recombining. It could also be things recombining to generate a photon, and that could have a different recomb recombination coefficient, but more on that later. So now let's add doping. And let's try to remember, does doping affect the recombination? Well, yes, it does. If I have more carriers, then electrons and holes should be able to find each other faster, and so their lifetime should decrease, right? So I have a semiconductor here that's been doped. It's p-type doped. I put boron atoms in here, okay? Those kick off holes, which are positively charged. They basically steal an electron away from a silicon and they become negatively charged. Steal an electron from silicon, you create a hole, right? And then I've got my thermally generated electrons and some thermally generated holes. So what you see here is a combination of thermally generated holes and doped holes and just thermally generated electrons. And I always have some recomb I mean some generation and recombination occurring at any given time. Now the question was, doping, does doping affect recombination? We said, yes, it does, because if I have more holes, right, then it should be easier for electrons to find those holes and recombine. But to be clear, recombination is not dopants recapturing their carriers. So once a boron atom generates a hole, creates a hole here, that hole does not go back to the boron atom at 300K. It's always there. 
So the key point is we only care about the thermally generated carriers finding each other and recombining. So, therefore, the lifetimes for electrons and holes must be equal, even with doping, because the only lifetime we care about are those that are thermally generated. Again, if the doped holes can't go back to the atoms, then the only percentage of the total number of holes that we care about are the thermally generated ones. And we know for thermal generation, you get one electron for every one hole, and every time they recombine, it goes down equally. And so the lifetimes for electrons and holes are equal, even if you have more total holes for the doped level and the thermally generated level combined. Now, we have generation and recombination rates, right? So these are rates, one over second. So if I have one over second that gives me a rate, there must be a lifetime for carriers as well. So, if, of course, we've got carrier lifetimes. We're familiar with that concept. And remember, as doping goes up, these average lifetimes go down. And so here's an equation here, which is valid for doped and undoped cases. And my carrier lifetimes, both tau n for electrons and tau p for holes, if I increase my doping levels, the carrier lifetimes go down. Okay? Key point again, the carrier lifetimes are equal even for a doped system. They must be equal. The doped amount of carriers don't go back to the doping atoms. They basically have infinite lifetime. So the only amount that can recombine and which we keep track of are the generated ones. That's why these lifetimes are equal. So, for example, if 10 to the 14th per cc holes disappear, that requires a change of 10 to the 4th per cc electrons, right? And so therefore the lifetimes for the generated amounts of carriers, again, they must be equal. I'm not counting in the ones from dope, dope, from the dope level because they don't recombine. Let's look at an example and see which carrier populations we care about. Okay? So let's assume we have gallium arsenide and it's dope p-type to 10 to the 15th per cc. So here I have a, a plot of concentration versus time here. So here's 10 to the 15th and we're tracking holes here, okay? And if I calculate, if I know my intrinsic carrier concentration for gallium arsenide is 10 to the 6th, then I can calculate the electron concentration as Ni squared over P naught and find that it's really low, 10 to the minus 3 per cc for gallium arsenide. That means you have to have a thousand cubic centimeters to find one electron. So it's really low. They're almost all gone because I doped so many holes that it's killing off all the electrons, right? So let's assume that 10 to the 14th electron hole pairs are created at t equals zero. And I could generate those by shining light on this, right? I could have light come in, be absorbed, and the photons create electron hole pairs. So the first question, will the electron and hole lifetimes be equal? Well, yes, we just said that on the previous slide. The dope holes are always there. They're ionized acceptors, so we don't worry about them. And we could look up from data tables for this doping levels for gallium arsenide and find that the electron and hole lifetimes are 10 nanoseconds. Okay? Next question, should the generated electron hole pairs affect the carrier populations? Well, of course they will, because I'm adding, as I, as I generate electron hole pairs, I generate 10 to the 14th, that's going to add to the amount I started with, 10 to the 15th and 10 to the minus 3rd. But think about that. It's only going to practically change one of them. If I add 10 to the 14th to 10 to the 15th, that's not a big, big change. If I add 10 to the 14th to the 10 to the minus 3, that's a big change. And so we'll show this in the plot over here. But, you know, you can see here's the carrier concentration versus time. At t equals 0, we generate 10 to the 14th. Here's the p-type concentration. You can see here's 10 to the 15th, and then right at t equals 0, you're adding in this tiny little mint to get to 1.1 times 10 to the 15th, which is 10 to the 14th plus 10 to the 15th is 1.1 times 10 to the 15th. And then over time, that excess we created recombines and I get back down to my normal level of 10 to the 15th per cubic centimeter. The one that we care about the most is the minority carrier concentration, which is electrons, very few electrons. And so when I generate at t equals 0, 10 to the 14th electron hole pairs, my electron population has gone up from 10 to the minus 3 
to 10 to the 14th. It's a huge change. And then I see versus time, a big change over time because it's not going to go down to this base level of doped, uh, doped holes. There are no doped electrons, and so it's going to go down very close eventually to zero, 10 to the minus 3 in this case. How do we calculate the slope of this versus time? Well, the excess versus time is the excess you created at t equals 0, 10 to the 14th, and it exponentially decreases versus time by the time t divided by the lifetime tau n. This is an exponential, so of course I want it to be unitless, so I've got time over time, and it ends up being unitless. I put in tau n 10 to the minus 8 into here, 10 to the 14th out front. This is a log plot, so this exponential then looks linear in terms of the decrease over time. So again, this one changes a lot, and notice for p, the whole concentration is a function of time. It changes, but you really don't see much of a change because you're on top of a huge 10 to the 15th care concentration to start with. Okay, that's it for this, this first part of the three parts of this uh, lecture. Do some of this review, take a break. For the semiconductor shown at right, when it comes to recombination and generation, is it more important to track the electrons or the holes? This should be easy. We just went through this. Okay. Next question, why are the electron and hole lifetimes equal, even if the number of carriers are as much as orders of magnitude different? For example, P plus N like we have over here. Again, you should, this should be easy based on the slides we had before. Here's the hint. Do the dopants recapture the carriers? That is to say, can ionized boron recapture a hole to become neutrally charged boron? Next question, a semiconductor with, this is the calculation, a semiconductor with Ni equals 10 to the 8th per cc is doped P-type to 10 to the 15th. So I've got 10 to the 15th holes. And I optically generate 10 to the 16th electron hole pairs. If the electron and hole mobility is the same, for a given voltage applied to the semiconductor, how much will my drift current increase due to the optical generation? So right when I generate these carriers, how much is my current increased? This is an easy calculation. Here's your, here's your options, and here's a hint as well.